Welcome, everybody. We sure are glad to um, have you with us this afternoon. So many, so great to see so many names of families that we're lucky to work with. Um, we're going to let the room assemble, and then I'll kick us off, but very quickly I'll hand it to Jed, who is the person you want to hear from today. So again, thanks for joining us, and we'll get going in about two or three minutes. Welcome everybody as you assemble. Um, we're going to give a couple more minutes on this Sunday afternoon for um, people to join us and then we will jump right into today's topic, which is always of so much interest to parents, particularly parents of juniors who are about to embark on their journey to college. So uh, give us one more minute as folks assemble and then we will get going. Bob, one question for you. In terms of the deck, I mean, I threw in stuff about the digital uh, SAT. Is the group here only junior parents? Or uh, it's a mix. So it's uh, it's actually a, couple, a smattering of seniors, some juniors, and some sophomore and freshmen. Perfect. Okay. Because that's obviously a lot more relevant for, you know, for the current sophomores and, and the current freshmen. Yeah. But uh, that, that helps. Thanks. Sure. Okay, we'll get going and some folks will join us as we're in process. I'm Bob Carlton with College Match Point. Many of y'all know that already because um, we're lucky to get to work with your families. If we don't work with your families, College Match Point is a team uh, based in Central Texas, but now across the country. Uh, and we help students thrive in their journey to college. Um, a couple of housekeeping notes. I always feel embarrassed to say this nowadays because we all have sort of um, been in the world of webinars for so long now. Um, this webinar will be recorded. Um, I'll share tomorrow this recording and the deck as well. Um, if you have questions, it's easier for me to track your questions in the Q&A box um, than if we bounce between chat. Um, and I will assure you that um, my level of expertise on specificity of testing questions is far outstriped by Jed's. So we'll try to get to questions, but the more narrow the aperture on the question, the more likely we will not be able to answer it on today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar, uh, which is, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, Jed, the third time you've been kind enough to do this with our parents, is on testing trends and their impact for students. Um, and generally speaking, we like to try to put this in some context. Some of y'all were with us when we did a webinar last spring where we gave a snapshot of what's happening. Um, application inflation is real, particularly for the most selective schools and particularly for students. Um, on average, students at our major high schools that we work with, um, on average, apply to one and a half to two and a half more schools. So their college list was bigger, colleges got more applications, and um, Jeb will talk to you about this, but there is a direct line, not just correlated, but probably causal, based on test optional policies. Um, two other items, more students applied to popular majors. Um, uh, we saw this across the student base that we work with, and we've heard it from our colleagues. Um, and then admissions yield, um, the idea that I offer X number of offers of admissions and Y number of students accepted has become more and more of a calculation for schools. Um, now, an asterisk to that. Harvard typically doesn't care about yield, but there are a number of schools and more than you might expect where yield is a meaningful consideration for the school. Um, to put this in context, since parents of juniors make up the largest part of today's um, attendees, um, we encourage uh, students to focus on five priorities this fall. Um, and frankly, if they focused on one, number one, they'd have the best fall they can possibly have as juniors. And that is 
academics, academics, academics. Most students are a couple of weeks into the fall semester. Get comfortable. Get comfortable asking for help. Get comfortable in the rigor of classes that you've chosen. And when you feel like you're standing on firm ground with your two feet, then there are four other priorities and they're not really in rank order. Um, many students, particularly those targeting competitive schools or public universities, are trying to think about what their major is and how that influences their activity plan. Um, as the fall goes on, many students are developing a first draft of their college list. And then um, the reason for today's webinar, many students, particularly those that didn't take standardized tests this summer, are finalizing their standardized testing plan. And it's awfully hard to plan if you don't know sort of what got you here and what's in front of you. So today we are lucky enough to have with us um, what I consider sort of the preeminent expert on standardized testing for college admissions in the United States. Um, Jed is a friend, but also um, someone that um, many of our families work with um, his team. Um, and Jed has a unique gift for consuming the um, almost endless data about standardized testing and making sense of it and adding meaning to it. Now as a parent, his kids are young, but I think Jed has an acute understanding of just how stressful this can be for um, juniors and their parents. So I will stop screen sharing and talking and I will turn it over to Jed to take us through today. Thanks so much for being with us today, Jed. Perfect. Oh, my pleasure, Bob, always. All right, let me start the slides here from the beginning. Um, and yeah, and we're going we're gonna to share the slides too if there's some facts or data here that you want to reference later on. Happy to do that. And let's begin talking about testing, all things testing. So when the last two years have been very interesting in the world of assessments and testing, um, you know, it's always changing. I've been giving this talk for 20, 21 years now. Um, and there, there are definitely periods of inflection where, you know, there are some years are pretty quiet, pretty calm. Pandemic onward, it's been not very calm and very quiet. It's been some huge changes in our space in terms of testing, what it means, um, how should I think about it? Should I send scores? Will it, you know, will it help me, hurt me, all these things? Um, and there were questions about you know, what was going to happen. I, I was worried you know, in the beginning when tests around the country, it was optional everywhere. Like, what does this mean? Because kids couldn't test. Now kids can test. Dust is settling. And now we're seeing now what does testing mean? How does it fit into the calculus for students, for colleges? Why do some still prefer it? Some are more flexible with it. Uh, and so hopefully today we'll answer many of those questions. Now, the new world order, we have two options. I can submit my test, uh, I can send my scores to a school or I can withhold them for the vast, vast majority of schools, you know, but for a small handful who are currently test required. Um, and then there are schools, about 64 of them or so, who are test blind, where even if I have amazing test scores, they don't matter. Um, but that middle ground, some 2,300 or so schools, you have a choice. Um, and so that really is, you know, about uh, today's um, discussion. So there, even though tests are optional, it's important to understand that there are many things that are optional that are quite impactful. Um, the level of rigor of your coursework, that's a choice you make. Do I send my AP scores or not? A choice again you make. Do I show interest? Do I show up? Do I do tour? These are all, you know, options, but they can affect the decision. So even though tests are optional, doesn't mean that they're not impactful. Uh, and that's going to be a part of the you know the, the talk today. So test optional. What does it mean? It means that if you have a application, there are no test scores. They're going to read it. They're going to consider it is a complete application. Uh, the same as you don't have to send your AP scores. If you do, uh, they they become part of the conversation. So any school who's optional, they're going to have some uh, lane of kids who have test scores, some who don't, and they're reading back and forth over the course. You know, looking at one high school, we have twenty kids with test scores. We have 17 without test scores, and they're looking at these kids, bouncing them back and forth. Um, and so, but if you send scores, again, they're part of the conversation, the same as if you send a bunch of AP scores, they become, for most colleges, part of the conversation. By the numbers, you have now over 1,810 colleges that are test optional on the Fair Test website. That's more than three fourths of schools in the, in the US. That is a tremendous increase from pre pandemic when you had 1,000 
But of the top 100 schools, the most likely schools in the country, you had maybe you know six, seven, eight schools on that list. Now that whole list, but for a few schools, is, is optional, but for the Georgetowns and the MITs and a few other schools. Uh, so it's really a, a new world, and the new world is, is optional testing. So it's dominant, and we don't ever see a world uh, in the future where tests where test optional isn't the dominant position. Um, I, I don't see this massive resurgence of suddenly of you know the majority of schools in the U.S. require testing. I think they've seen there are benefits of test optional, uh, and they, they've gotten some you know application pops. And also there's there are demographic changes coming to the U.S. We're going to have fewer kids demographically, you know, flu, especially few, fewer affluent kids who have the resources to support the schools. Um, and so they're going to be reducing barriers to applications for the next 10 years. And, and making tests optional is one way to reduce barriers. And there'll be many others coming as this cohort of, of kids gets smaller over the next 10 years uh, because of the you know, declines in the U.S. birth rate and so forth. So more colleges are embracing test optional for the long term. Uh, in the very beginning of the pandemic, there was a perception that, you know, about a third of schools or so would go back to test required. Uh, Inside Higher Ed found that, you know, roughly that number. Then there's a survey conducted a year ago by uh, Ernst & Young and Parthenon Group, these consulting groups, and they surveyed 207 admissions officers, say, where do you see yourself three to five years? And again, about a quarter to a third said, well, we're going to require testing. Um, and about two thirds said optional, five, 10 percent test blind. Um, a more recent survey, which I think is really more indicative of where things are, is the Princeton Review did a survey just released uh, two weeks ago of 200 colleges and where you're going to be next year. And, you know, I test optional, we're up to the low 80s. Um, so again, we're, we're shifting from low 60s, 70s, now we're in the 80s. Um, and the number of schools who are co contemplating next year being test required, uh, you know, 3% um, are firmly in that, in that group of this survey and 6% are undecided. And then test blind, you know, it's in that five, 10 percent range, um, you know, schools who are test blind. And that, that's pretty much on, on target. So the majority of schools haven't committed to making a long term commitment. So if you have a freshman or a sophomore, there's definitely a chance things could change, um, you know, a, as they get more data. We, we know for sure when schools who are selected go test optional, what, what changes? What changes is the inputs change. They're going to get more applications from more kids for schools who are selective. But the question is, how about the outputs? Are there differences between these two cohorts when we actually compare the two, their performance and run regression and say, okay, are the kids with scores, are they different in meaningful ways than the kids without scores in terms of their GPA, freshman year, sophomore, four year, differences in four year graduation rates, differences in course taking and major selection. And if there are, you know, does it help or hurt our institution? So many schools, they have now data from two years of classes of test optional, many of them want four. Um, before they commit to making a firm long-term decision. Um, Harvard announced uh, last year, that, you know, or earlier this year, that we're going to do four more years of optional. This is our pilot. And then we're going to look and look for differences. And, but when Harvard moves, they tend to you know, have a lot of weight and influence other schools uh, who look to them for, for guidance as you know, the oldest, most established school in the country. Um, and the question is, like, when, when colleges go optional, what do they get? Now, schools were selective, more applications. Then they become more selective. They, they are perceived as being tougher to get into, more, more desirable. Additionally, what you the main thing you get is the ability to admit lower scoring kids without any impact on your, your class profile or your class rankings. Um, if you want to bring in you know, the super affluent you know, um, development kid who's you know, had awful test scores, bring him in. Those test scores now don't exist. Um, they, you know, he applies without test scores, no problem. We love you. Additionally, there, you know, some schools say we want to get more diversity, um, you know, more first gen kids without lowering our, our score profiles, not a problem. Those kids apply without test scores, and then the school's profile is intact. So it gives them a, a, the, the ability to let in and craft the class however they want without worrying about rankings or perceptions or profiles. So that's a very nice thing, giving them cover to admit their class. Um, and so as Bob mentioned, you know, the inflation, application inflation is very real, especially at certain schools and for certain students. Uh, and it's making it a little bit harder for certain students. So there's definitely been more ambiguity, more uncertainty about, will I get in with this, these grades, this rigor, these scores? It's less certain today than it was five years ago to say, you know, if you're giving, I think there's a 40% chance. Now it's, you know, there's a pretty wide range. I'm applying to UC Irvine. What are my odds? Like, well, you know what? Five years ago, I could have I told you here. Now, not, not as sure. 
Um, and here we're seeing a few of the changes. Uh, the N NYU pop 30% two years, UCLA 38%. These are some pretty, pretty big meaningful changes. Duke, I remember when they were reading for 20,000 kids and then they popped to 50,000 kids. I mean, they, they've, they were 30,000 kids in 2016. I and mean, it's just huge increases to the name schools. More, more people want the name schools, the, the brass ring. Colgate more than doubled. In one year, they doubled um, and they kept going. So when you go just optional, a lot of kids who didn't have the scores are like, well, let me apply because I didn't have, you know, Duke won the 33, 34 ST. I had 27. I'm not going to apply to Duke. Suddenly, optional, I'm applying to Duke. So a lot, a lot more kids are applying. Um, the selectives, they all became more selective. Small list, Williams, Kobe, MIT. Again, Duke went from 11% to 4%. Um, Auburn popped. Northeastern, that kid's going there, they really popped from 20%. Now they're down to under seven. Um, and they're really pushing towards early decision. Not kids have gotten in recently with, with ED and certain schools are moving that direction um, to manage some of this increase in yield, uh, increase in application, um, you know, pops. Ivy, you know, the Ivies are all very silly. They're three, 4%. So if you're applying to an Ivy now, uh, you know, and you can't apply to 10 Ivies and hope you're going to get in. It's not, it isn't like that in terms of if they're all under 10%, you can apply to all of them and get into zero very easily. Um, but when you're looking at numbers this low, when I applied to Penn, it was in the like low 30s. And now it's in like the, you know, five, four and a half, five percent. Penn and Yale didn't even give their numbers this year. Or I'm sorry, Princeton and, and Penn didn't want to even publish their app numbers. Um, same as Stanford earlier. So one of the things that that's moving, it's happening, they're focusing on yield. And one of the main yield levers is early decision. So we're seeing a lot more schools putting more energy towards early. And this has been happening for years. But the pandemic really popped it because you have all these kids applying. And one of the main factors for predicting who would come to a school was test score. Um, because part of it is in terms of are you matching, are you undermatched, overmatched? If I have a 32 ACT score and applying to, you know, to, to Brown, they would look at that test score as saying the likelihood of us yielding this kid is X or Y. When there's no test score, there's less certainty in terms of is there a match for this, the, the student's ability? Uh, are they going to pass down Brown, you know, in the test score? Are they going to go to a higher or lower school? So one of the ways you manage uncertainty is you lock kids in early. And we're seeing a lot more of that. One example I just pulled was Boston. Um, and they've been playing this game. They, in 2011, they had 370 kids coming in ED. Now it's 2130. So they're, they're filling more than half the class. But this is a trend at selective schools. Um, that, you know, when Penn and Duke broke 50%, that was a big deal. Now we're seeing more and more schools. We saw Barnard, you know, like Brandeis in the 60s. So things are shifting. I think, you know, Tulane is filling so many of their, of their kids with early action, early decision. So that this is a, definitely a change. And part of this is being wrought and, and expanded by this focus on test optional admissions. So um, there are advantages to going to optional, I mentioned, but losing test scores has some costs. Again, predicting yield has been a little more challenging. Um, and then, you know, you also lose other information that could be valuable. Um, why they matter, test scores are a hedge against grade inflation. The grades are going up around the country and they have been for about 20, 30 years. There's competitive dynamics, you know, looking at you know, game theory, the kids down the street have 3.9, their kids have three sixes, it's gonna hurt our kids. Um, unless they're really sophisticated and understand the nuances across high schools and grading cultures. So typically what, what's been happening over the, you know, all the states, especially affluent zip codes and private schools, more inflation, um, and having A's doesn't mean as much as it did in, you know, when I applied to college. Um, a lot more kids have all A's than they used to. Um, additionally, test scores are a fairly strong predictor of graduation within four, six years, which matters for colleges. It's part of the rankings. Um, and it's also helpful to, you know, compare kids of a broad, diverse bunch of students. Test scores give you information. Um, and finally, it helps kids di differentiate students who look very similar for the schools who are very selective. So there are reasons why test scores don't matter. Um, there are a couple states where test scores, uh, you know, are still required. Uh, here at um, in Georgia, the flagships, UGA, Georgia Tech, Florida never dropped the requirement. Um, UT Knoxville. I'm going to update this because I think I pixelated my images when I downsized the uh, the uh, the formatting. So I'll I'll get better images on these. Um, oh yeah, for sure. Well. So we have a perception that test out, um, required is going to spread some to the southern states. Um, Texas, for a quick minute, posted something that tests are going to be required for UT Austin kids um, two years out. 
then after three days, they retracted that. Uh, the same thing, UNC, uh, you know, Chapel Hill, they said test score is going to be required in two years. Then they, they, they also pulled it back and said, you know what, we're still optional for two more years. And so they're still, and Chapel Hill, their rationale was there may have been pandemic effects and learning loss. Uh, let's give the kids a couple of years to catch up and then we'll test them. Other schools, you know, Texas didn't give it a rationale. I think there was some pushback among some populations of stakeholders. One of our colleagues, Rick Clark at, at, at Tech here in uh, Georgia Tech said, the South, he thinks a lot of Southern schools will come back. Uh, Georgia reinstated in 2021. Um, he says the Carolinas, Alabama, Mississippi, is like there will be more of them coming back test required in the, in the, in the near term. Um, MIT went back earlier in the year. Georgetown went back earlier this year too. So you have to have a test order to apply to these schools. Um, and MIT, their rationale was, hey, our research shows that we cannot predict who will do well at MIT without a, a math score. Um, because, you know, there are a lot of kids who have A's in calculus, but some of them have an A in calculus and get a one on the AP. So, that, you know, they haven't learned that much calculus, even though in their, their grading culture is very lax in their school. Um, if I know you got a 790 on math or a 34 on the ACT, I know something about you that I can compare you to other students with national standards, you know, and that's because there are 30,000 public high schools, um, you know, it's, it's a lot, so they don't know every, every school's grading culture, but I know what a 790 means on the SAT math. So that's one thing they said, that's why they're requiring it again. Um, so right now, only five out of 100, you know, common app schools require testing. It's the Georgia schools, Tennessee, a few others that the military academies. So outside of this list, it's a world of optional and then the small world of test blind. There is something coming down the pike, which may make a big difference. Uh, in October, the um, Supreme SCOTUS will hear a case against uh, Carolina and against Harvard. Um, these are parents who want to get rid of affirmative action, um, and they want to eliminate and make it illegal to use any race in admissions at all. Right now, it's you know under a very tailored minimal thing. And if they do this, and it, it seems like SCOTUS, you know, they're not you know beholden to precedents or other other, you know, I think they may overturn it whole, whole cloth. And if they make affirmative action effectively illegal at the college admissions level, um, and you can't consider race at all in testing, it becomes more challenging to require testing and say, because there are differences among, among uh, groups of, of students that become harder to, 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 to defend essentially, um, if you have tests required, but test optional, it changes the whole thing. And then, you know, because otherwise it's harder to, to balance that. So they're gonna rule in June, um, and after that ruling comes out, we're going to see. And if so, it may be tougher for the MITs or the Georgetowns to say we're going to, you know, go for diversity and also require testing. So we'll see how this plays out. Um, there, there was a policy called test flexible, which really isn't a thing anymore because all the schools are now test optional, where you could opt out of testing if you had a certain threshold, or you could send us AP exams in lieu of these. Uh, but right now, you know, social schools require them. Um, they're all optional at this point. Um, and, but there is a co concept of test flexible. If you don't send an SAT score, if you don't send an ACT score, then your AP scores loom larger and they're more important. Your, any IB scores you have from, you know, junior year become more important. Um, and so it's like, you know, we need something, because again, they know how to read a four or five on BC Calc. They know how to read a physics four, you know, they, they, they can, uh, on comp sci, they know what this means. Um, whatever your grades mean, they know what a five means on national level. So if you don't have a, a SAT score, AT score, but you have strong fours and fives, they can essentially stand in in some capacity. And, and so that's a, it's a, it's a soft test flexible, even though it's not on their admissions you know, pages. So it's a way to demonstrate excellence you know, by sending these scores. And we've had people say, yeah, these matter more today for kids without testing than they did three years ago. Um, Cornell was clear about that. If you don't have an SAT, an ST, we're gonna look more closely at everything else you, you do have. We're gonna look more at your rigor and GPA at other testing becomes more important uh, absent a SAT or ST score. That just makes sense. So there are a small number of colleges who refuse to use test scores at all. For, uh, for 20 years, they were called test blind. Now they're, they're being branded as test free. But if I send them a perfect score, it doesn't matter. It's not part of the conversation. It won't help me in any capacity. Um, so there are 34 of them are in California, um, between UC and Cal State, because Cal State's a pretty big program, you know, the 11 or 12 UC schools and all the Cal State schools. Um, they're test blind. 
And so whatever you send them at 36, they don't care. That's, that does, it doesn't even factor in. Um, there are 17 colleges who are piloting blind for you know, Caltech, there's some others, um, but they're, again, they don't wanna rule until they get more data. And the fact that MIT went test required, I'd be surprised if Caltech stays test blind, but well, yeah, again, every school does their own analysis and the MIT data may be different than Caltech's data. So there are 84 colleges, that's about 3% of the total pool. But you know, there was Sarah Lawrence, there was like one school before the pandemic that was and for, for years, Bates and Bowdoin and Worcester Poly and Wake. We've had schools be optional for, for decades, but blind wasn't a thing. Uh, there, and, and then suddenly it's a thing. So this is a new reality in testing, but again, it's still a, uh, a, major, a small minority of schools. Here are some of the ones who are test blind this year, but not permanent. Caltech, CUNY, Dickinson, Idaho, Reed, Washington State, Boise. Um, oh, actually, I have to move Washington State over to the permanent. I'll, I'll fix that. And Pitzer. And then the ones who are permanent, Washington State College and University. Then some smaller ones, Northern Illinois. Um, you know, uh, there's New Orleans, Catholic, um, St. Mary's, and then the UCs and Cal State. So, and Worcester Poly is doing an eight year pilot. All right. It's important that you all understand that test optional and test blind are not the same thing. And parents sometimes, you know, I've heard test scores don't matter. They're test optional. I'm like, whoa, 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 slow your roll. Um, these are, you know, the same thing as AP scores are optional, but do they not matter? No, they can, they can factor in. Um, and so they can strengthen up application. They can also increase your chances of getting um, merit-based financial aid for schools who use uh, test scores in their calculus. Um, and you know, many of them look at test scores as well as rigor and GPA when they're factoring who gets merit-based financial aid. So one of the ones I often refer to is Alabama. Uh, my niece uh, in Richmond, she applied to a bunch of schools, South Carolina, Tulane, um, she applied to Alabama. She had a, a 1390 SAT and they knocked tuition down from $30,000 a year out of state to $6,000 a year. Um, and so that's a big difference. Then you're, you know, suddenly, you know, it, it was a savings of $96,000 in Alabama. That's, that's tremendous. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that Alabama has actually become a much, much more competitive school. I think 40% of their kids have like a 3.9. Um, they have like, a, you know, over 30, like 32 ACT. It's really becoming a different school because this money matters. You tell a parent you can go up to, you know, go to Kenyon or, so, you know, spend, you know, 70 a year or go to Alabama and spend, you know, 24 a year. And then they're, they're pulling kids who would be otherwise going to Brown and Dartmouth and Kenyon and Oberlin because of these scholarships. So Bama, it's, you get the football, but also you get a pretty sick deal if you have good tests, uh, scores, and good grades. Um, a few other ones, Texas Tech, you can get up to $9,000 a year with scores in class rank, Lake Forest. There are a few others. There are, there are many, many, many more, and you want to look at your list and, and talk to the schools and see if the scores factor in. Uh, I live in Georgia, and in Atlanta, we have something called the Zell Miller Scholarship. Uh, it's part of the Hope Scholarship, and which is funded by our, our lottery. Um, Sal Miller put it in place back in '94. And if you have a, you know, you have to have a 1,200 or a 30, a 26 ACT to be eligible. And if you are eligible, if you are eligible with a GPA and testing, tuition's free. That's pretty amazing. That's one of the reasons why Georgia Tech and UGA uh, went. Like UGA was, I applied to college in '93, and Georgia was a backup school. Hey, everyone from my high school, like if I can, you know, if everywhere else fails, I'm going to Georgia. You can't say that anymore. Uh, the Hope Scholarship has totally transformed Georgia because again, kids who would have gone to UNC and spent, you know, 30,000 at tuition and, you know, 20 something on the board to $20,000 a year uh, for four years are now spending a fraction of that staying in Georgia. And so parents who have three kids, it's a big deal. His college is now really expensive. So these, these financial incentives are massive and they've turned Georgia Tech and, and Georgia into reach schools, not backup schools. So we're seeing that at other schools also in the country. So there's a real question of, you know, do I submit my scores or not to optional schools? Uh, and you have a, you know, a choice to make. Um, ultimately, weak scores, you don't want to send them, but strong scores, they can help you. If there are other weaknesses in the applications, scores can help smooth things out. Um, they, they can demonstrate your readiness for college level work, and they can affect merit-based aid and placement. So the question of rates of submission, how have they changed? Before the pandemic, about four out of five kids sent a test score. Uh, last year, it was under half. So that's a big change. Although schools are more selective, it's skewed towards, there's still more kids applying. 
Um, we also know that there's a larger share of males applying with test scores than females, and that's because of, the, of STEM effects. You have more STEM, more STEM kids are applying um, with test scores. They want to show off their math chops. Because if, you know, if, I'm, if I'm trying to go to a physics or a math or pre-business with all the finance uh, or engineering, and there are more males in comp sci and engineering and physics majors. So that's why we have more, more guys applying with test scores than females. Um, here is some of the data from the common app. It's a two-year-old data, but they haven't updated it. So it's all we have um, that at the private schools, we did see a difference that schools who are more selective uh, have a markedly higher rate of test submission than schools who are less selective. So you see a number of 40%, but that isn't across all school um, bands. So for the selective publics, schools who are more selective, you have 65% of kids getting test scores, two thirds, um, versus less selective publics, it's under half. So that is a new one. So if you're looking at a school that's, that's more selective, know that more kids are sending test scores to those schools on average. Um, and Strategy. It used to be before the pandemic, only four out of 100 kids would send scores to some schools, not others. It was either I sent my scores or I didn't. Now, um, again, we have two year old data. That's all we have. Um, about two years ago, a quarter of kids sent scores to some schools, not to others. That number, I am certain, is higher now um, because of just the knowledge that scores can help you here, not help you here. Um, so we're going to see more of that going on. That's part of today's talk at the end. Jason, yes. Jeff Yes. Chad, I'm going to jump in real Please. quick. Yes. Um, if you can go up a slide. Yes. As a context, um, the last season we saw half of the students that we work with choose to submit scores to some colleges and not to others. What uh, Jed is referring here to strate uh, strategic submission. And students are able to do this because they can see the 50% range from the published admitted class profile that a school at, uh, shares. So the good news is students can see this, it's thoroughly transparent. Um, and we are seeing already this year, a likely increase over that 50% in terms of students that are um, be becoming strategic submitters. Fabulous. Um, and so, yeah, so all we have is two year old data, but I, I know also from, anecdotal and just talking to everyone there, there's more and more of this. It's, it's much more than normal before. Um, now, when it comes to majors, do you see a lot higher rate of submission for kids applying to engineering? They want to showcase their math scores and business because they're going to be taking the finance and derivatives. It's, it's all calculus. They want to show off their math scores, but a much lower submission rate for gen ed kids or social work students or general you know, education. So it's STEM kids want to showcase their chops, more STEM kids send test scores. Makes sense. Um, and, you know, it, testing conditions, they, they mostly normalized, um, but we do know that, you know, we haven't achieved the final end state. Things are still in flux. Um, we know there will be more test submitters next year and next year, unless something massive happens, but we're not going to ever get back to the 80% number. I think that's just, that's the past. The new world in an optional world, and you're going to have a, a, probably a, a, you know, a lot of kids, not the majority, then the strong minority of kids without test scores. Um, all right. Now, the, the big question is, did test scores make a difference? Uh, and this is, you know, I think pretty important to understand. That's the question of, it's optional, doesn't really matter. It's like, well, slow your roll. Let's look at some data. Um, here is Boston College's data. So they had 17,000 kids apply with test scores. They had 23,000 kids apply without test scores. Now, BC accepted 5,000 kids with test scores but only two and a half thousand without test scores. So the rate of acceptance with test scores is about 30%. And the rate of acceptance without test scores is about 10%. That is the, what the most striking we've, we've seen in this admission cycle, but that is just giving you an example of someone who says it's optional, doesn't matter. That clearly indicates there's something here happening. Um, that's, that's, that's surprising. And there is a point to be made that there, there are two aspects here when you see a difference like this. One of them is called correlational. One of them is called causational, um, that the test scores are the thing driving the higher admit rate. Correlation would say, no, the test scores are also pointing to something else. So kids who submit test scores, they have higher test scores. On average, kids with higher test scores tend to have better GPAs and better rigor. So it could be the test scores are pointing to other things or it could be the package together. But it's, we will never be able to get that data um, in terms of what what portion of this is correlational or causal, 
But when you see something this dramatic, a 3x effect, clearly test scores are having some impact. Here is a broader, and we have data on all these. Um, they, this is not a common data set. We actually went and scrubbed news releases, press releases, went on their websites. So UVA, the, the advantage, you know, they let 26% of kids are getting in with test scores versus 14 without. That's a 90% pop. Notre Dame, it's double. 11% without tests, 22% with tests. BC, again, 170% increase. That's pretty dramatic. Tufts was about a 50% increase. Barnard, same thing. Wellesley, 80%. Emory was about 100% increase. Uh, Colgate, 108%. Um, Vandy was much smaller. Um, that was data from Jeff Selingo. So there is, it seems like test scores on average are doing something. But again, we can't ever tell out exactly how much is correlation, how much is causation. We, I have talked to some admissions officers like from Embry, other places who tell me if they have two kids apply from the same high school, kids have similar you know, academics profile, similar level of rigor, ADPs, roughly similar GPA, 3.8. One kid sends a 35, one kid sends no test scores. They're like, on average, like that, that, that 35 makes a difference in our discussion. We know something more about that kid. Now it's from Emory, and Emory's advent rate is double. So that, that tells you there is some causal pressure. It's not just correlational um, there. So the question becomes, should I send in my test scores? And it comes down to, will it help or hurt? Before you do a darn thing, get your baseline tests in. Figure out where your kids are going to be. Get a baseline SAT and a baseline AC. Then you're going to look at those middle ranges, as Bob mentioned. Um, if you're close and you feel like you know you can get up to a threshold where it would help you, it's you know, I, I would say go for it. If you're well below, if you have amazing grades, fabulous rigor, you have 11 APs, everything's beautiful, and you have a 24, then honestly, it's going to be a, such a lift to get you anywhere where your score is going to be meaningful. I would say let's rest on the strength of that GPA and the rigor. I wouldn't touch testing. However, if I have, let's say, a little bit softer, let's say I have a 3.8, 37, let's say I have six, seven APs, but you know, and I, I, I lead out with a 30 on the ACT. Should I push for a 33? I would say, yeah, I think you probably should. Because in this case, with your grades and your rigor, if that, that could actually push you up and make you more competitive. So, you know, do, do you want the emissions officers to see this score? That's the main question. Will it help you? Jeff Selingo said, you know what? One dean said, you know, there's similar emission rates, but with STEM kids, it makes a difference. Now, again, no one is reporting this. There isn't a school in the country saying our STEM admission rates with test scores is this, but we're getting, you know, Jeff is a reporter who talks to people and he's an author. Um, Sean Felton, and we've given talks with Sean from Cornell. He's like, you know what? There are certain majors where test scores aren't as impactful, fine arts, classical music, test score, but there are other ones where it does matter more. If you're gonna be a business major at Cornell, other places, yeah, test score can matter more. Um, and then Rick Clark said, go with your strengths. Um, if you have a test score on that upper half, that mid 50, it's gonna help, it can't hurt at all. If you're in the lower 50, it depends. If you're in the bottom quartile, Rick said, I probably wouldn't send it. And that's, and I'll show you a slide about that later. It also matters with your GPA that, you know, if some, many kids, their GPAs, test scores are aligned, but some students, they have grades below and the test scores are higher, you send the scores. But if your grades are really exceptional and there's great rigor and your test scores are, are middling, I probably in that case withhold the scores. Um, and then the section scores matter. So it may be, I have a 1350, let's say. And so I'm lower than the school's profile if they want a 14 to a you know, 1520. However, embedded in that score, I have a, a 790 in math and I'm, a, I'm applying as an engineer. I want them to see my 790, even though I have a weaker verbal than they're looking for, because it, you know, it's part of that coherent narrative. That 790 is part of my story, which I wanna make sure they know, um, even though I scored below on the composite score. So certain, and the same thing in a verbal, I'm applying to a writing program, I have weak math, that 780 in, you know, in verbal helps me. Um, there's also a piece we heard from, it was actually the head of a Johns Hopkins. He's like, you can't unsee a weak score. And ultimately you send me, he had a kid who had really great grades, good, you know, but he sent a one, he had all A's and AP classes. He sent a one on AP calculus. The kid had a 94 in the class. The kid scored a one. And then suddenly that one, it called in the question what he'd actually learned in that class. He had a 94, but suddenly it's like, oh, are they giving away A's in that class? Because if you get a one, you know, you really haven't learned the material. So then that affected the way he read the application. So you don't want to ever send a weak score. 
you don't want to send a one or two typically on an AP. You don't want to send a, a you know a 22 on the AC. It's not going to help you. And then suddenly it calls into question other stronger elements. So don't weaken your hand. Um, treat every school differently. Um, it's not an all or nothing, as Bob mentioned, half of his of, of the cohort here, college match. They have to send to some schools, and you can choose on Common App, I want to send to this school, not to this school. And you can just go through the list and see, help me, hurt me, send it, withhold it. Uh, and then here's one example, like Swarthmore, the middle 50, um, 680, 750 um, for verbal, 7790 for math, composite, 1380 to 1540. So do I send or withhold? If you're in the top half, 1470 or above, it's going. Send it, period, paragraph. If I have a 1350 and I'm the bottom quartile, I, I wouldn't send it in most cases. Unless someone told me, like, listen, if you're applying from Wyoming, if you're applying from Montana to Yale, they, they, they don't have enough kids or, my, or you're you know, from the Ozarks and you have a score where you're so much above your, your peers. But, but if you're, you know, a more populous, you know, a higher scoring profile of students, then, you know, I probably wouldn't unless you're like first gen, something that's really special and you're super proud of the score. Typically, you wouldn't send a score that low on profile. The real discussion becomes in that third quartile. And that's where it, the, it depends really comes into play. I'm much more likely to send a 1460 than a 1380. I'm, I'm just shy of that middle mark. Um, I'm also, it depends on how good is my GPA. If I have an amazing GPA, amazing rigor in a 1390, I don't want to dilute it. I want the whole story to be about my great grades and score and, and academic rigor. But if I have more modest rigor, you know, and I have a 1440, I'll, I'll probably send it. So again, the third quartile is where you have the real discussions about send or withhold. Otherwise, it's pretty clean in most cases. Um, there is a, a factor that score ranges changed. Um, here, I showed you before the pandemic, here's Georgia. The middle 50 um, was 1220 to 1390, uh, ACT 27 to 32. Pandemic hits, bam, test optional at Georgia. Suddenly, the middle 50 pops to a 1350 to 1490. Well, that's compelling. And also, you know, their middle 50 goes from a 31 to a 34. Before, a th you know, a 32 with, with a great score for Georgia. Suddenly, it's a middling score because a under about half the kids didn't send test scores. Then suddenly they go back to test required uh, and then things go back to more normal at Georgia. And then again, a 29 is still a decent score. Whereas before you would never have sent it and a 30 for sure I would send. Whereas during that optional year, I wouldn't send it. So that one thing that's meaningful to me when I'm coaching parents about looking at score profiles, I say, look at the common data set for 20, 2020. Go back two years, just give it context of where they were before the pandemic hit because, you know, I think it's meaningful to look at that uh, and get a sense. And it's very simple. Type in CDS, you know, common data set, any school, Overland 2020. And they'll have PDFs, they'll have archived. Uh, it's very simple to find those. Um, BU, you uh, guys pull this up, common data set, Boston. So their middle 50, and they're, they've, they've been optional, but they, you know, they pop some from a 30 to 30, 40. They pop slightly. Um, you can see the pop in the most recent year on the, on the SAT. It went from a 1360 lower level to a 1390. And part of the reason, look at the submission rates. The uh, number of kids sending SATs dropped from 73% down to 33%. So you shaved off some lower scoring kids. On um, the same thing, you, you, you know, you less than half the number of kids sending ACTs. So when you have fewer kids submitting, naturally your test scores, you're, you're, you're lopping off the lower you know, part of the curve, the lower tail. And so then everything shifts up. But I, I still want to look and say, well, do I want to send my 1370, um, 1380? I would still say yes. Um, you know, even though 1390 is now the new floor, I would look back a year or two. And a 1380, you know, it's still, I think, pretty compelling looking back at the past two years. Okay. And here are some examples of pre and post. And it, it, it's up around 20 points everywhere. Emory popped, um, Colgate popped, Davidson, Yale, Tulane. And everyone's up a little bit. Vermont's up a little bit more. They went up like 70 points. So I think a lot of Vermonter kids didn't submit. And that's one of those things where schools were less like, like you know, like Vermont isn't just like a Michigan or a Texas or a UNC. It's not one of the public Ivies or Virginia. So a lot of their, their kids didn't submit test scores. And so that's why I really popped that range. Okay. Um, a few notes. How are we doing on time? It's now 544. Um, things, just trends. Uh, I'll go fast through the digital because we have time for that really still ahead of us. 
Um, sectional testing is dead. There was a big discussion around, are we going to have, it was, it was going to be a big story. Um, 2020, they announced you're going to be able to walk in there and take just a math section and go home. That just died. And the reason it died, um, Janet Godwin came to a, a talk here in Atlanta in June and said the college admissions officers were not convinced it was a good thing. And they were not going to alienate them or hurt them. So they just, they stripped any mention of it from the website. It's now dead. So that was a big story for us, but now it's a non-story. Um, and then testing was going to go digital in uh, September of 2020, the pandemic hit. Uh, and then they said, they don't have any dates for a digital release. And they said, we're always going to have an option for paper. That's surprising because the SAT is going completely um, digital in about a year and a half. So things are shifting, but less so for the ACT. The essays are still around, but don't take them in most cases. Um, there are you know, dramatically fewer kids taking them, though some states require it. And, and some international kids want to showcase their writing skills by taking it. Otherwise, when the SAT killed their essay, this they became a non-factor. So I wouldn't worry about it. Uh, College Board, they're making dramatic, enormous changes, not for the juniors or for the seniors, but for the sophomores and the freshmen. Um, they got rid of their subject tests. They got rid of their essay. And they're, they announced a full migration to computer-based testing uh, March uh, for the October PSAT next year. So that's coming up in, geez, 12 months. Every kid's taking a digital PSAT in the country. Um, and, then, and then that March, every kid's taking a digital SAT. Big changes coming um, for the for the sophomores, and why would they do it? You know, it's going to be more reliability, simpl simplified processes, um, faster results coming within days. Tests are more efficient. Um, the tests are shorter, about two hours versus three. More time per question. Shorter reading passages. Um, top score is still the same. Timing. Um, you're going to have two hours and 24 minutes for the whole darn thing. That's a fast SAT. And kids like it. It's remarkably shorter. Um, and the amount of time per question has been really increased. I'll show you some of that data. So you have the setup. We have a 32-minute um, reading and writing, which is now combined. Reading and writing is now one thing. And then you, I, I call it verbal because that was what it was called when I, you know, for decades. And then you have the adaptive section. I'll talk about what that means. 10-minute break. Then you have your math baseline and your math adaptive section. Two hours, 24 minutes, and you're done. And you go home. That's just amazing. Um, and in the section structure, you're going to have, uh, for every section for verbal, um, you have two questions that don't count. They're experimental. And 25 that do count. So they're going to have four questions that are experimental you know, per, per verbal and for math. So eight total to help pre-test questions for the next um, test. So they're trying to norm certain questions. How difficult? Is there any bias in, the, in, in, in a question? And so forth. Uh, make sure it performs well. So the timing per question, look at this. This is crazy. This is for the, the a digital SAT time per question versus ACT. For a verbal question on the SAT, you have 71 question, seconds per question versus 44 for the ACT. That is tremendous. That's a 60% increase in time per question. In a similar fashion, for a math question on the ACT, it's 60 seconds. On the SAT, it's 95 and a half seconds. That is profound. That is, that's a whole accommodation. That's like without a disability. So they're giving a lot of kids, and they actually ran assessments. The psychometricians who, who did, the, did the work, they, they played with adding four questions, taking them away, and they said a lot more kids finish if they get rid of those four questions. So they, they, so they, they did this by research, and it turns out, yes, this helps kids. So we're going to have so few kids running out of time on the ST ever again. That's going to be pretty rare for the majority. And, then if, and the kids who have real timing issues, They'll have accommodations and they'll have, you know, for their testing, um, which are very easy to administer on a computer. Time and a half, you type in a code, time and a half. It's very easy. Double time, type in a code, double time. Very simple. Test content is most of the same. They're, they're cutting the number of word problems. There's less reading on the SAT coming up. Um, short form reading section scoring is the same. Um, you know, they're not going to have to change concordances. Um, we're going to see if that plays out, but that's what they've announced us. So an adaptive, what does it mean? So it's section adaptive for you sophomores and freshmen. You're gonna have one baseline section that everyone gets in a, a similar section. And then you have an adaptive one based on how you do. And you're not gonna ever have, like, you can have two kids in the room and they'll have different sections. Um, and, but earlier questions matter more. So here's a, a so an example, you get your baseline math score, you take it. And then if I do poorly, 
They're going to give me an easier section. If I do well, they'll give me a harder section. Same thing for verbal. Um, and so here's an example. So there are 20 baseline math questions. Let's say I get five right and I miss 15. Bam, they're going to filter me to the easier section. My, my score range here is 200 to 550. I, I'm not going to be able to do better than that because I've already missed a bunch. Um, and even though if, if I even if I crush this section, I've already missed too many to, to kill it. Uh, let's say I get 15 right, okay? They filter me to the harder math section. And then I'm going to have a certain range of, of scores here. Um, I'll, I'll be bracketed by my initial performance. That's why it's called section adaptive. It'll, but there's not going to be 10 levels. It'll be two, easier or harder. Um, but again, you have 10 kids in the room. They're going to be taking different questions, different. They'll be equivalent, but not identical tests. So it's harder to cheat. That's one of the best parts of this. It's more secure. Timeline. So international, um, it's happening. Geez, March, what is that? That's that's seven months away. So for kids out of the US, it's happening seven months. Um, then we're gonna go with the PSAT, it's happening in October of next year. And then adaptive domestically next March, bingo. Um, and they've already announced some of the formatting, some question types. We're gonna have um, full practice tests in this fall. And then, but again, for you domestic kids, this only matters We'll start doing the prep probably next January. So we, we have we have a while. We have a while still. All right. Now, um, they're not going to also ever return full paper tests anymore because they're going to live in perpetuity in the problem bank. They're going to give us more problems to work with, but there's no more, here's my PSAT, here's my test return. That goes away. And kids seem to like the new format. 80% say it's better than the paper. That's compelling to me. Uh, and there are 5,500 person pilot studies. And we have kids though, some of them got their pilot results back. Some of them were happy with their results. Some of them weren't happy with the results um, because some of them thought they did really well, but they may have done pretty poorly on the first and got sent to the easier section. So they did bad on the baseline, better on the adaptive, felt they did great, but that was a false perception. And they ended up scoring lower than they actually thought they'd scored. So there is a balancing point there. Um, so why kids like it? Shorter, shorter passages, more time per question. You always have a calculator which is a new thing and also fast results. A lot, a, lot of, a lot of candy here for kids. We've been working with this. We already been working with digital STCs and we're gonna have our own version of this ready for our kids. So we'll be ready when it comes. Um, a few quick notes, um, what, what Apple Ruth is, what we do if you don't know our work, um, we focus a lot on kids' self-belief, their perceptions, motivation, you know, anxiety, all these things we help with. We do academic work, test preparation. And one of my, my passions, is we, we coach kids on executive functioning and helping them manage themselves. That's, that's my primary work as an EF coach. Um, we're doing three webinars coming up next, next month and they're free. Um, how learning works. That's, uh, some of my background in ed psychology, how to prepare for you know, tests, classes, um, academics, how to demonstrate what you know, how to go in there and do well on assessments and performance. These are you know, my, my background in educational cognitive science stuff. Um, we also are doing writing workshops. If your kid needs to get, become better at uh, academic writing, um, for getting ready for college, or you know, we, we coach kids on how to become better writers. All right, so that is, that is my talk. So why don't we open this thing up and I will stop. Um, We've had time. some great questions so far, Jed, and I'm sensitive to uh, folks' schedules. Uh, does anyone have any questions that uh, Jed hasn't been able to answer so far? Um, one of the joys of having Jed join us on these is you can tell this is a person who is passionate and whose knowledge of testing is almost exhaustive. And so the information itself is exceptionally useful, but we want to make sure that if people have questions, we're able to tackle those questions um, I, I had mentioned in the uh, Gchat box, for those of you that want to nerd around on the data sets that um, Jed had mentioned, um, we have a number of families who really like collegedata.com. It is not exhaustive, but it does have many of the top schools and is a sometimes easier way to navigate the yeah. common data set. Um, Makes sense. But it's looking like um, Jed, as he so oftentimes does, anticipated all the pertinent questions. Um, we so appreciate everybody joining us this afternoon.
we will be sending out the follow-up um, on this. And I did want to note, um, uh, we are, uh, we, the students that we work with work with a number of different test prep providers. Um, Apple Ruth is one of them, and our families are huge fans of their students whose work has been with Apple Ruth. And then Apple Ruth has been kind enough to extend to all the students that we work with the opportunity to take uh, free practice tests um, so that this fall a student can begin to understand which of the two tests is a better fit for her. Um, and we'll include the link for that page if you haven't already scheduled uh, students practice tests. It's a handy, helpful way. And we encourage families, if they don't already know which test is the best fit for their student, to try to set a goal to know that um, before the Thanksgiving break. Um, again, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, Jed. Okay. Thanks to all the parents and students who joined us and um, enjoy the rest of the day. And we hope school is off to a great start. Thanks, everyone.